Hello, Doug Phillips here with the Vision Forum, welcoming you to tape number two in our Christian Controversies in American History series. The tape you have in your hand, Puritans vs. Witches, What is the Truth Behind the Salem Witch Trials, seeks to address from a biblical and historical perspective one of the most controversial aspects of American Christian history, the Salem Witch Trials. Our lecturer today is Dr. Paul Jaley, who happens to be pastor of New Testament Church in Plymouth and the education director for the Plymouth Rock Foundation. We hope you enjoy this tape, and we welcome you now to Puritans vs. Witches. Controversies in American History The Puritans and Witches You know, when we look at America's history, it is remarkable that so many lessons could be learned by believers who live in the 21st century. One of the reasons for this is because America was founded by Christians who attempted to live godly lives by following the scriptures, and they faced many of the situations in life that we face today. Therefore, lessons can be learned from how they obeyed God and the scriptures, as well as lessons being learned from the mistakes that they made. And we'll see both when we deal with the nine-month period known as the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. In the Bible, we read from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Here, Paul the Apostle introduces in the book of Ephesians his famous passage on spiritual warfare and the armor of God. Taking the scripture in its context, the armor is Jesus Christ, as Romans 13 tells us, and verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Thus the armor of God and each of its pieces are part of the nature of Christ that every believer is to put on and stand in, because our enemy, the devil, does not cease in his attempt to attack, to thwart, and to slow down the progress and advance of the kingdom of God. Now we know the devil will not ultimately be successful, but we also recognize that there are times when his presence And the things that he attempts to do to thwart the kingdom of God become very real and illustrated and magnified, particularly when believers do not walk in their full godliness and the full armor that is made uh, provision for them in Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. When we come to the topic of the Salem witch trials, we need to look for a moment at the history of Salem itself. About nine years ago, At the 300th anniversary in 1992 of commemorating the Salem Witch Trials, I began to uh, brush up on my history of Salem and do an in-depth research on the Salem Witch Trials themselves. And when we look at the history of Salem itself, we find in the very beginning, long before Salem is founded in 1626 by Roger Conant, we find the man who was really most instrumental in giving a vision for the settling of this fishing village in the 1620s. This gentleman's name was Reverend John White. John White was a very well-known Puritan, well-known for his zeal and godly lifestyle. And it was John White who uh, was also later on in 1644 part of that noble delegation that wrote and compiled the Westminster Confession of Faith. John White made this amazing statement prior to the founding of Salem, almost signifying both its destiny and prophesying of the coming major war that would take place in Salem. He said that it will be a service unto the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world and raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist. With that statement, John White, in essence, declared war on the demonic kingdom. And not only would Satan not forget such a statement, 
the individuals that come on stage in the 1690s would forever indelibly mark American history with a major lesson of spiritual warfare. After John White's vision, Roger Conant was a man who really defined Salem's mission as being a peacemaker, initially coming to Plymouth Plantation but not agreeing with the Pilgrim Separatist Church structure and more in keeping himself with the Anglican uh, Church of England, he moved and became that individual John White was looking for in founding Salem in 1626. He did not go there for just light reasons. In fact, he was willing to stay to the hazard of his life when many others did not want to stay there. And thus, Roger Conant became an individual that was not divisive, but an individual with great character, and began to define Salem's mission long before it had a name called Salem. John Endicott was sent as governor a couple of years later in 1628 and became uh, the element of Salem's strong leadership. It was Samuel Fuller, one of the deacons of the Pilgrim Church in Holland, and the doctor of the pilgrims when they came, that was sent that first winter after John Endicott arrived. And uh, when he came and preached on the pilgrim form of church government and other topics, uh, not only did he heal them physically, but letters were written back to William Bradford, governor of Plymouth Colony, that he healed them in more ways than merely the physical, also the spiritual. So the pilgrim influence upon Salem was quite great. And when Salem actually elected and confirmed their own elders, rather than having them merely appointed top-down, as uh, many of the churches in England used to do. In fact, there was a delegation from Plymouth that went in an ordination service there in Salem. Then in 1629, Samuel Skelton and Francis Higginson actually named the town from Psalm 76-2. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. John Winthrop, who arrived with 17 ships and more than 1,000 people in 1630, simply defined New England in essence. He did not want to move to Salem after seeing the mud huts and how difficult it had been for them to live there. The original charter that John Winthrop sailed under that was written in 1629 rather, uh, spoke specifically of evangelizing the Indians. And then his covenant of 1630, written on board the ship Arbella, called um, the uh, model of Christian charity, made that famous statement that all eyes shall be upon us and we shall be a city that is set upon a hill. That kind of defining Boston. Well, Salem comes before that. And when Salem was actually uh, in operation, there was some contrast and some great similarities with Plymouth. In fact, the pilgrims, uh, in the pilgrim story, God preserved Cape Cod for the pilgrims. For the Puritans, he preserved Cape Ann for Salem. God drew the pilgrims to Patuxet, what was known as Patuxet to the Indians, due to its rich geography. And God drew the Puritans to Nomkeeg, named by the Indians, due to its rich geography. Patuxet had been abandoned by the Indians due to a great plague, and so had Nomkeeg been abandoned by the Indians due to a great plague as well. Patuxet was renamed Plymouth, a place where its destiny would become one small candle that could light a thousand. Nomkeeg became Salem a place where its destiny of peaceful mediation could be fulfilled in the midst of larger settlements. And in essence, God prepared the pilgrims before they arrived in the New World, and God prepared the Puritans as they arrived in the New World. And we see the difference, both in a contrast and in development, with the town of Salem. The witch trials themselves took place many years later, in 1692. During a nine-month period, more than 100 people were accused of witchcraft. 20 were put to death through the accusation of seven girls who had been involved in occultic practices and bringing spectral evidence or dreams, visions, and supernatural marks into court as evidence. And they ranged between the ages of 9 and 20. And most accused were social enemies of their parents. That brief sketch gives you the essence of what took place those nine months, but so much more was involved. If we take the historic rendition that in the intolerance of Puritan Christianity was really what caused the Salem witch trials because they persecuted everyone who disagreed with them. They persecuted the Quakers. They persecuted everyone else who wanted the religious liberty they came to America to achieve. 
Now, this is a warped view of the Puritans, and it doesn't take into consideration the conduct of many of those Quakers that received, quote, their persecution. Neither does it fully and uh, clearly represent the Puritan beliefs and the, uh, in Christianity and how they desired uh, to be more tolerant. Even though it is true, the Pilgrims were far more tolerant in Plymouth than often the Puritans were in Boston. Still, that historic rendition of merely an intolerant Puritan community was what really gave rise to the Salem Witch Trials is not really accurate. If we go further and look at the tourist attraction in Salem even today, it's known as the hysteria of 1692. And often the Puritans are looked at as hypocritical because, after all, they, their rigid Christianity would not allow anyone else a variety of expression, and thus individuals that wanted to express themselves through witchcraft uh, were not allowed to. In fact, this hypocritical notion of the Puritans living a double life or uh, deliberately saying one thing and then uh, living another was popularized in the 1940s by Arthur Miller's The Crucible. And his rendition of the Salem Witch Trials couldn't be further from historical accuracy and also bore with it a vengeance against the Puritans uh, with this idea that it was an hysteria. He made up romances and uh, sexual exploits between some of the individual's adults and some of the girls that had been accusing others of witchcraft. And um, that has no basis in history. Or we could take a third view that is popular, and that is the Puritan bashers. Uh, what, uh, in fact, many people believe that the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 depict what life would be like if Christians actually ruled the nation or ruled in politics, because they would cer certainly hang everyone that disagreed with them, forcing everyone to believe in Christianity by governmental fiat. And once again, that's an, uh, uh, an improper view of the Puritans, and certainly not one that takes into account a broad range of facts and beliefs. But the truth is... The Puritans were intolerant of sin. Thus, they were guilty as charged. They were Christians who were serious about living in God's grace. And that meant the exposure of sin and the operation of church discipline in dealing with it. Now, that's not popular today. And it doesn't mean that everything the Puritans did was right, or even everything the Puritans believed about the Old Testament law was legitimate in application to their society. But what it does demonstrate is that indeed they were sincere. In fact, they were Christians who took more seriously their walk with God than most do today. Another aspect of this is it, the witch trials were indeed an hysteria. They became that. But we have to recognize it was an attempt to deal with spiritual warfare, with real witchcraft that really did take place, with real trials in the civil sphere that had the death penalty attached as a punishment for the practice of witchcraft. And yet in New England, it was far better than all throughout Europe when dealing with witches. In fact, in Europe, it was considered a sin against the monarch and against civil government itself if you practiced witchcraft. And thus, you were burned at the stake. You, were, you often didn't even go through a trial. You were not even given the opportunity to defend yourself in any way. And thus, the torturous method of capital punishment, coupled with a lack of a trial, left all of Europe with a great stain in their dealing with witches. Whereas in New England, the Puritans attempted to improve upon that practice of dealing with individuals that did not go according to the civil law and their righteous code. And thus it was far more tolerant with a, a trial that uh, was to take place based on common law. And thus very few witches were actually persecuted or even tried in New England in comparison to Europe. And yet it still seems tremendously harsh today. As far as Puritan bashing goes, we need to have an honest look at what went wrong. Because several things really did go wrong in those nine months and become great lessons for us today. This we need to walk back in history and see what some of the leaders were saying about the spiritual war against the kingdom of God rising in New England, even before 1692 takes place, in order for us to fully understand what was going on. One of the first indications that major spiritual warfare was taking place was uh, known through Governor w uh, John Winthrop's diary and journals. There he chronicled the great contention that the Puritan leaders had with a woman by the name of Anne Hutchinson. Now today, Anne Hutchinson is looked at as a, uh, one of the pioneers of women's liberation, a pioneer of, of freedom for women. 
And yet, when you read the actual court cases, when Anne Hutchinson was summoned to court by the Puritan leaders, it was actually the fact that Anne Hutchinson espoused a mystic Christianity, an antinomian type of Christianity, where the Holy Spirit and the subjective leading of the Spirit in her heart took precedent over the written Word of God. Indeed, if the written Word of God conflicted with her leading, then there was a new meaning to the written Word of God. It sounds often like many of the tendencies today. She influenced uh, William and Mary Dyer, and all of them, in some cases, it was also similar to some of the beliefs and practices of Roger Williams. And yet, this Mary Dyer and others were involved in the occult. Mystic Christianity, if believed, uh, really and attempted to be practiced, can take you into a very difficult place. And we learn a lesson here that those who place the internal subjective leading of the Spirit on a higher plane than the written Word of God are practicing situation ethics. They're not allowing any of their motives or actions to be tested or corrected by others. And they can come under great demonic bondage. In fact, some of those strange occurrences, houses shaking, Mary Dyer giving birth to an actual scaled monster that was witnessed by two or three people even dug up after it died, because it was born a stillborn. Those kinds of strange occurrences of real witchcraft and spiritual warfare was chronicled by Governor John Winthrop. And then further on, we see the remarkable war that took place called King Philip's War. And uh, when one, one considers King Philip's War, we need to recognize it was a war to exterminate Christianity. And um, interesting in... Uh, after King Philip's War broke out, Josiah Winslow, governor of Plymouth, commented on the fair treatment that the colonies, colonists had given the Indians. And he said this, I think I can clearly say that before these present troubles broke out, the English did not possess one foot of land in this colony, but what was fairly obtained by honest purchase of the Indian, Indian proprietors. Nay, because some of our people are of a covetous disposition, and the Indians are in their straits easily prevailed with to part with their lands. We first made a law that none should purchase or receive of gift any land of the Indians without the knowledge and allowance of our court. And if at any time they have brought complaints before us, they have had justice impartial and speedy, so that our own people have frequently complained that we erred, on the other hand, in showing them over much favor. Now, this is, was written consistently by historians that the Indians were fairly treated. Then what on earth occurred in King Philip's War. We can look at it from the external and say, well, maybe Indian tribes felt they were being squeezed out of their hunting grounds and their lands. And yet when we go back and, and, and deal with this, we recognize for years John Eliot, the apostle of the Indians, had been preaching to the Indians in their own language. His disciples had multiplied tremendously by the 1660s and had helped to form many praying Indian villages where they adopted common law, English-style culture in some aspects, and became praying Indian villages, whole communities set apart and discipled, and they were set up near the English towns. Representative government, bottom-up type of uh, government was established. Rulers of tens and, and, and fifties and hundreds, just like Exodus 18 exhorts. In fact, John Fisk, tremendous historian of the late 1800s, notes the following when he says, By 1674, the number of these praying Indians, as they were called, was estimated at 4,000, of whom about 1,500 were in Eliot's villages, as many more in Martha's Vineyard, 300 in Nantucket, 700 in Plymouth Colony. There seems to be no doubt that these Indians were really benefited both materially and morally by the change in their life. Now this evangelism was growing so rapidly toward the end of the 1600s that indeed Fisk demonstrates why there became a jealousy between the rise of the kingdom of God and evangelism taking place uh, from John Eliot's praying Indian villages and those Indians not yet converted. Fisk puts it this way, His Eliot's design in founding his villages of Christian Indians was in the highest degree benevolent and noble, but the Indians could hardly be expected to see anything in it but a cunning scheme for destroying them. Eliot's converts were, for the most part, from the Massachusetts tribe, the smallest and weakest of all. The Plymouth converts came chiefly from the tribe next in weakness, the Poconokets or the Wampanoags. The more powerful tribes, Narragansetts, Nipmunks, and Mohegans, furnished very few converts. When they saw the white intruders gathering members of the weaker tribes into villages of English type, teaching them strange gods while clothing them in strange garments, they probably supposed that the pale faces were simply adopting 
these Indians into the, their white tribe as a means of increasing their military strength. Thus, King Philip, who was the grandson of Massasoit, and uh, who had befriended the pilgrims, began a hatred toward the white man and toward particularly the ones who had brought Christianity to the Indians. And when they would speak, converted Indians would speak of the kingdom of God overcoming the kingdom of darkness, those that had been unconverted among the Indians felt that surely meant war. And thus they struck first, killing two or three converted Christian Indians who had become pastors of Indian churches and buried their bodies beneath a pond in the winter and began a slaughter, a wholesale slaughter of the Christian Indians and the white folk that had brought Christianity to them. But it's important to note that the atrocities that took place during that war and often the gruesome way in which the Indian tortured the white man was a symbol and a picture visibly of the invisible spiritual warfare that began to be raging in New England. And it's, re it's important for you to recognize that it was attack upon the kingdom of God. And it's interesting to note that this attack was um, very uh, quickly picked up on by Cotton Mather and Increase Mather. And Cotton Mather says in his book, Wonders of the Invisible War World, which was written just after the witchcraft trials in October of 1692, chronicling the trials and how they went, he, he reflects upon this demonic attack in all of New England when he says, the New Englanders are a people of God settled in those which were once the devil's territories. And it may easily be supposed that the devil was exceedingly disturbed when he perceived such a people here accomplishing the promise of old made unto our blessed Jesus, that he should have the utmost parts of the earth for his possession. The devil thus irritated immediately tried all sorts of methods to overturn this poor plantation. And so much of the church as was fled into this wilderness immediately found the serpent cast out of his mouth a flood for the carrying of it away. I believe that never were more satanical devices used for the unsettling of any people under the sun than what have been employed for the extirpation of the vine which God has here planted, casting out the heathen and preparing a room before it and causing it to take deep root root and fill the land so that it sent its bows unto the Atlantic Sea eastward and its branches unto the Connecticut River westward and the hills were covered with the shadows thereof. But all those attempts of hell have hitherto been abortive. Many an Ebenezer has been erected unto the praise of God by his poor people here. And having obtained help from God, we continued to this day. Wherefore the devil is now making one attempt more upon us, an attempt more difficult, more surprising, more snarled with unintelligible circumstances than any that we have hitherto encountered, an attempt so critical that if we get well through, we shall soon enjoy halcyon days with all the vultures of hell trodden under our feet. An army of de devils is horribly broke in upon the place which is the center, and after a sort, the firstborn of our English settlements." So you see, Cotton Mather here saw the Salem witch trials as a culmination of a spiritual war against Christianity and the kingdom of God in all of New England. When John Hale, who was present for much of the trials and has, had been a pastor in Salem, later wrote about their abuses and the lessons to be learned in his book, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, which he published in 1697, he also commented on the biblical basis of why God would allow Satan to have attacked Salem village. He writes, The Lord delivered into the hand of Satan the estate, children, and body of Job for the trial of Job's faith and patience and proof of his perfection and uprightness. So the Lord hath delivered into Satan's hand men's children and, bo and bodies, yea, names and estates into Satan's hand for the trial of their faith and patience and further manifestation of the sincerity of their professions. So we see that this was indeed an attack of the demonic kingdom noted by the Christian leaders of the time in all of New England. Well, were the Puritans just holding crazy notions of spiritual warfare, or were they orthodox? Were they biblical in their view of the demonic kingdom itself? Well, I want you to just review a few things about why this, this took place. In fact, um, uh, one of the brief narratives of another Christian leader, Diodat Lawson, made some of the following observations when he said this, It pleased God in the year of our Lord 1692 to visit the people at a place called Salem Village in New England with a very sore and grievous affliction in which they had reason to believe that the sovereign and holy God was pleased to permit Satan and his instrument to affright and afflict those poor mortals in such an astonishing and unusual manner. 
and make no mistake about it, the attack was supernatural with almost every manifestation that you read about in the Gospels taking place in Salem Village. Well, that quote gives us a lead-in to some of the beliefs that the Puritans in Salem believed about the demonic kingdom. First, they believed the devil's power was limited by God's sovereignty. The devil just can't do what he wants to. He has to be permitted by God to do things. The devil's not sovereign. God is sovereign. A second belief that they believed that the scripture does support is that the devil works most successfully where sin abounds in practice among people. In other words, the devil can work more successfully where people are regularly sinning. That is a scriptural concept. Ignorance of the enemy makes us an easy prey for deception. That's another truth. The third truth taught by the Puritans, which is a, a good biblical truth. A fourth truth, if we indulge in curiosity and focus on the devil's power, it'll become more spectacular. We must always focus on Christ and his elevation primarily. Indeed, another confirming truth. A fifth truth that they believed in their writings, that Satan and his demons are fallen angels and now exercise their wicked natures against the saints. Very true and biblical. They dwell in the air and the atmosphere around the earth and they attempt to thwart the plans of God. Another truth stated clearly in Scripture. The demonic kingdom is an organized government, much like a military, centralized, top-down, so that rulers are assigned to nations and cities and families. Indeed, the Scripture we read earlier in Ephesians 6 would note the same. And finally, they believed that Christ's kingdom would progressively have ultimate victory over the devil's kingdom. So, indeed, we cannot fault the Puritans or their beliefs for something gone wrong with the Salem witch trials. Indeed, they were following biblical uh, understanding of this. Now, in Increase Mather's 1683 book entitled Remarkable Providences and Cotton Mather's 1689 book called Memorable Providences, both of these books by the great Mather writers compile evidence of supernatural encounters and spiritual warfare done in New England. You need to recognize that spiritual warfare was going on during this time preceding the spiritual uh, the, the Salem witch trials. In fact, we're talking about them dealing with supernatural spirits that speak uh, uh, through individuals where a woman would have a male voice, for instance, or levitation where some, a body was actually lifted off a couch in one of Cotton Mather's examples almost to the ceiling until he was able to bind in the name of Jesus that demonic ruling spirit that caused that kind of a manifestation and the individual was delivered. These were chronicles of deliverances, spiritual warfare that was remarkable in the 60s. 1600s and, and often believers would be foreign to in their own Christian walk today. So we find that certainly spiritual warfare was not something that was completely foreign to these individuals. But there was a problem. The condition of Salem prior to the Salem witch trials was all but spiritual. One of the first things that had taken place was a three generation backsliding that had taken place particularly around the Salem village. Fuel for demonic bondage, according to 2 Corinthians 2.11, which states that the enemy can have an advantage on us if there's unforgiveness and bitterness in our midst. This had taken place in Salem. And amazingly, over a period of years, there was a bitter rival between the Putnam clan and the Porter clan over land usage and inheritances. And they had been suing one another in court. And the unforgiveness had run deep. One can only imagine what conversations took place around tables where children were listening to the bitterness of their parents against pastors and against leaders and against the different things that had fallen to them. And thus, a general backsliding had taken place. Also amazingly, from 1689 to 1692, in October of that year, New England in general, because of the arrival of Governor Andros and the establishment of a complete monarchy by England over the colonies and the colonies' resistance to it, and from the fact that Salem Village did not have its own government until the late 1692, it was constantly in a feud with the town of Salem. Thus, they had no local self-government or control. The churches frequently did not exercise church discipline, looked to a civil government uh, arm that the Puritans had erected to deal with church controversies and heresies, and looked at that from a distance. And so you had a ripe preparation for some disorder in Salem Village prior to 1692. 
The Putnam family, most of the children were the accusers of the Putnam family clan, though they were not all named Putnams. And the Porters were in a land feud that lasted two and three generations, as we mentioned. And because they were going at each other with such venom, they were not following biblical law regarding Christians bringing issues into court against other Christians. They were not practicing church discipline and privately trying to settle matters between themselves individually. Furthermore, the pastor of Salem Village, Samuel Paris, was a, was a business failure and then was driven into the ministry in essence and he began to preach disputing his wages more than preaching the gospel. He frequently took side on issues in even publicly in the pulpit through his sermons taking sides on factions in his congregation. Not a wise move. And in general he was no check on the lawless spirit operating among the Putnam Porter clans. There's a key lesson here. When individuals violate biblical law, in this case suing one another, it's a source for public disorder. Second lesson we can learn, when the church violates biblical law, does not exercise church discipline, the civil government usually has to operate outside of its jurisdiction in a lawless manner, taking on more than it's ordained by God. Paris was the last in a long string of pastors who were never satisfied serving in Salem, and many had left the ministry entirely once they had left Salem because of all the bitter divisiveness and the backslidden carnality that existed there. And it was actually, amazingly, in the Paris' own family with one of his daughters operating in his own basement of the parsonage where the occult activity began to take place in the winter of 1691 and 1692. His own child, Elizabeth, as well as his servant, Titubo, which he had brought from Barbados, who she brought some of the black arts that she had learned there and began to practice and demonstrate to the children the supernatural powers of the occult. And this is where it began, in the basement of the pastor of the t village church in Salem. Now, how could New England have fallen so low? Well, it's interesting that Cotton Mather wrote in the 1690s, he wrote this, he said, we must humbly confess to our God that we are miserably degenerated from the first love of our predecessors. However, we boast ourselves a little. The first planters of these colonies were a chosen generation of men who were first so pure as to disrelish many things which they thought wanted reformation elsewhere, and yet with all so peaceable that they embraced a voluntary exile in a squalid, horrid American desert rather than to live in contentions with their brethren. Those good men imagined that they should leave their posterity in a place where they should never see the inroads of profanity or superstition. But alas, the children and servants of those old planters must needs afford many degenerate plants, and there is now risen up a number of people otherwise inclined than our Joshua's, and the elders that outlived them. In other words, Cotton Mather saw that the torch was not adequately passed to the second and third generation. Even prior to this, William Bradford, in one of his poems, had written and thundered in 1642 with the same kind of problem when he wrote, O New England, thou canst not boast thy former glory thou hast lost, when Hooker Winthrop Cotton died, and many precious ones besides. Thy beauty then it did decay, and still doth languish more away. Love, truth, good men, mercy, and grace, and wealth in the world now take their place. Thy open sins none can them hide, fraud, drunkenness, whoredom, and pride. The great oppressors slay the poor, but whimsic errors they kill more. Yet some thou hast who mourn and weep, and their garments they unspotted keep, who seek God's honor to maintain that true religion may remain. Those do invite, these do invite and sweetly call each to other and say to all, repent, amend, and turn to God that we may prevent his sharp rod. Time yet thou hast, improve it well, that God's presence may with you dwell. Indeed, William Bradford had seen the same in the backsliding that was taking place in preparation, in essence, for soil that the demonic kingdom could use in its eruption in phenomenal supernatural manifestations. Now, instead of me merely describing what actually happened and how these manifestations came to be and what the Puritans did to resist them, I want to read to you from some primary sources. First of all, I want to let you know that this, the young girls, and here were their names and ages, that first began to accuse others of being witches, which started what has been known as the hysteria and which warranted, in essence, eventually these trials were as follows. Anne Putnam, Jr., who was 12 years old, Mary Warren, 20 years old, 
Mercy Lewis, 19 years old, Mary Walcott, 16 years old, Elizabeth Hubbard, 17 years old, and Elizabeth Paris, 9 years old, and Abigail Williams, 11 years old. It was these girls that spent many a night hearing stories from Tituba, the servant brought from Barbados from the pastor Samuel Paris, about witchcraft and about the occult and about the curious arts of seeing supernatural things take place. Indeed, that curiosity grips us today. Whether it's the game Dungeons and Dragon, Dragons, or the latest books by, about Harry Potter, the curiosity of the occult and witchcraft is something that does draw children, as we can see. When John Hale, who was an eyewitness to the trials, uh, described what happened, he wrote in 1697, remembering what happened, the following. Quote, I fear some young persons, through a vain curiosity to know their future condition, have tampered with the devil's tools, so far that hereby one door was opened to Satan to play those pranks. In Anno Domini 1692, I knew one of the afflicted persons, who, as I was credibly informed, did try with an egg and a glass to find her future husband's calling, till there came up a coffin, that is, a specter in likeness of a coffin, and she was afterward followed with diabolical molestation to her death, and so died a single person. A just warning to others to take heed of handling the devil's weapons, lest they get a wound thereby. Another I was called to pray with, being under sore fits and vexations of Satan, and upon examination I found she had tried the same charm, and after her confession of it, and manifestation of repentance for it, and our prayers to God for her, she was speedily released from those bonds of Satan. This iniquity, though I take it not to be the capital crime condemned, because such persons act ignorantly, not considering they hereby go to the devil, yet borders very much upon it, and is too like Saul's going to the witch of Endor, and Ahaziah sending to the god of Ekron to inquire." The first girl described here was Abigail Williams, who died a miserable death being single. The one described second as having been cured is most likely Elizabeth Paris, who was separated early on from the uh, trials and from the accusations and prayed for in order to be delivered of her demonic bondage. Cotton Mather was involved in that as well as Reverend John Hale. Interestingly enough, we find John Hale going on as well of exactly how the manifestations began. And he says the following, quote, In the latter end of the year 1691, Mr. Samuel Paris, pastor of the church in Salem Village, had a daughter of nine and a niece of about 11 years of age, sadly afflicted of they knew not what distempers. And he made his application to physicians. Yet still they grew worse, and at length one physician gave his opinion that they were under an evil hand. This the neighbors quickly took up and concluded they were bewitched. He had also an Indian manservant and his wife who afterwards confessed that without the knowledge of their master or mistress they had taken some of the afflicted person's urine and mixed it with meal and made a cake and baked it to find out the witch, as they said. After this, afflicted persons cried out of the Indian woman named Tituba, and she did pinch, prick, and grievously torment them and that they saw her here and there where nobody else could." Yea, they could tell where she was and what she did when out of their human sight. These children were bitten and pitched, pinched by invisible agents, their arms, necks, and backs turned this way and that way, returned back again so as it was impossible for them to do of themselves and beyond the power of any epileptic fit or natural disease to affect. Sometimes they were taken dumb, their mouths stopped, their throats choked, their limbs racked and tormented so as might move in heart of stone to sympathize with them with bowels of compassion for them. Mr. Paris, seeing the, seeing the distressed condition of his family, desired the presence of some worthy gentlemen of Salem and some neighbor ministers to consult together at his house, who, when they came and had inquired diligently into the sufferings of the afflicted, concluded they were preternatural, preternatural, and feared the hand of Satan was in them. Soon after this, there were two or three private fasts at the minister's house, one of which was kept by sundry neighbor ministers, and after this, another in public at the village, and several days afterwards of public humiliation during these molestations, not only there, but in other congregations for them, and one general fast by order of the general court, observed throughout the colony to seek the Lord that he would rebuke Satan and be a light unto his people in this day of darkness. Now that final fast day was actually called by the court in 1696, years later, for repenting for the way those witch trials actually did take place. But note there were tremendous supernatural manifestations where legs were moved in such a way and locked together that they would have to be broken in order to naturally unlock them. They were uh, frozen. They were at times uh, speechless as, they, uh, as has been um, uh, related here. 
In fact, um, uh, other uh, one other account of what took place early on in January, February of 1692 with these girls and manifestations that caused such a stir was written by Diodat Lawson, who had returned after having been a pastor in Salem, and to help pray for those afflicted. Um, and he had had an experience with the factions of Salem when he passed through there in 1684 to 16. He writes, quote, on the 19th day of March last, I went to Salem Village, lodged at Nathaniel Ingersoll's near to the minister, Mr. Paris's house. Presently after I came into my lodging, Captain Walcott's daughter, Mary, came to Lieutenant Ingersoll's and spake to me. But suddenly after she stood by the door, she was bitten, so that she cried out of her wrist. And looking on it with a candle, we saw apparently the marks of teeth, both upper and lower set, on each side of her wrist. In the beginning of the evening, I went to give Mr. Paris a visit. When I was there, his kinswoman, Abigail Williams, about twelve years of age, had a grievous fit. She was at first hurried with violence to and fro in the room, though Mrs. Ingersoll endeavored to hold her, sometimes making as if she would fly, stretching up her arms as high as she could, and crying, wish, 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 several times. Presently after, she said, there was Goodwin Nurse, Rebecca Nurse, and said, do you not see her? Why, there she stands. And she said, Goodwin Nurse offered her the book, but she was resolved she would not take it, saying often, I won't, I won't, I won't take it. I do not know what book it is. I am sure it is none of God's book, and it is the devil's book, for aught I know. After that, she ran to the fire and begun to throw friar brands about the house, and and to run against the back as if she would run up the chimney, as they said. She had attempted to go up into the fire and other fits. On the Lord's Day, the 12th of March, there were sundry of the afflicted persons at the meeting, as Mrs. Pope and Goodwife Bibber and Abigail Adams, Mary Walcott, Mary Lewis, Dr. Grid's maid. There was also a, 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 at meeting Goodwife Corey, who was afterward examined on suspicion of being a witch. They had several sore fits in the time of public worship, which did something interrupt me in my first prayer, being so unusual. After psalm was sung, Abigail Williams said to me, Now stand up and name your text. And after it was read, she said, It is a long text. In the beginning of the sermon, Mrs. Pope, a woman afflicted, said to me, Now there is enough of that. And in the afternoon, Abigail Williams, upon my referring to my doctrine, said to me, I know no doctrine you had. If you did, and you named one, I have forgot it. In sermon time, when Goodwin Corey was present in the meeting house, Abigail Williams called out, Look where Goodwin Corey sits on the beam, sucking her yellow bird betwixt her figures, her fingers, rather. Anne Putnam, another girl afflicted, said, There was a yellow bird sat on my hat as it hung on the pin in the pulpit. But those that were by restrained her from speaking loud about it. As you can see, the manifestations were very unusual and caused tremendous amount of stirring for individuals to all of a sudden see things, visible apparitions of a human being that really was not there, no one else could see them, almost like a ghost-like figure, uh, for them to have supernatural marks appear on their hand when no one was afflicting them. These things were recorded by more than one witness as tremendous evidence that indeed they were under some sort of affliction. Now the question is, though they went to fasting and they went to prayer, indeed that was good, still, how did they desire to take care of these situations? In fact, it, is a, it was a warning. A warning was given by several people to be very, very careful about how they deal with this. Diodat Lawson himself says the following, quote, We find no means instituted of God to make trial of witches, rash censoring of others without sufficient grounds or false accusation, and he willingly is indeed to be like the devil, who is a calumniator or a false accuser. That was a good warning that should have been heeded. In other words, Diodat Lawson was saying the following, though the Bible says, suffer not a witch to live, or gives the death penalty for the practice of overt witchcraft. The Bible also indicates, according to biblical law, that nobody can be put to death for a capital crime without two or three eyewitnesses to the crime. Now, if witchcraft is involving demonic spirits being sent on assignment to afflict someone else by controlling someone else in a way against their will, to cast a spell, then indeed one cannot see the spell. They can see what someone does, but they cannot see the spirit afflicting the pain. Thus, there can be no eyewitness. And that is why there is no evidence in the Bible of individuals having been put to death for witchcraft. It was more of a threat. It doesn't mean that the punishment was uh, not possible, but the idea was it was very, very difficult to have eyewitnesses. And thus common law would have had a check upon any of the individuals being put to death for witchcraft because indeed no eyewitness was really possible for witchcraft itself. Thus we recognize very clearly that indeed these trials began with under a tremendous cloud of confusion. Now one of the things that we must recognize initially when dealing with this
is one of the aspects was the acceptance of the girl's testimony directly. Now, since when do you take girls that are in rebellion to their parents that argue openly with the preacher on a Sunday morning and are evidencing all these demonic manifestations, why do you take them to be completely innocent victims of other people's witchcraft? In fact, the whole hysteria began to take its toll when these girls could just name someone even when they were in some kind of fit in the trials and that person was automatically accused of potentially being a witch. In fact, uh, it, uh, witchcraft as a capital crime was put on the books in New England, but the biblical law of having two or three witnesses tempered it tremendously, unlike Europe. Now, there were some superstitions that reigned during the days that um, these witchcraft trials took place from Europe. And these superstitions about how to determine who was a witch uh, coming out of England uh, involved some of the following, an apparition of the person's spirit, tormenting a victim, evidence of malice or extreme hatred toward another individual, confession of having made a covenant with the devil or writing your name in the devil's book, evidence of the practice of witchcraft such as dolls and pins, etc., the devil's mark, which was preternatural, supernatural in nature, the water ordeal where an individual was thrown in the water and dragged. If they floated, they were a witch. Uh, the water rejected them like the rejection of water baptism. An individual is unable to repeat the Lord's Prayer. That was another superstition of the day. The accused is dry-eyed or shows no compassion for the afflicted. The accused touches the victim during a fit. And if the fit ceases, then they may be uh, a witch for the spirit body must return, being transferred to the bodily contact. Well, a lot of these ideas, of course, have no grounding in Scripture. And many of the pastors of the day had succumbed to borrowing from some of these. Cotton Mather himself asked someone who had been uh, accused of a witch while before they were hung to repeat the Lord's Prayer. And they were even hung even after repeating it perfectly. So, indeed, we have a problem when we go extra-biblically to try to find out whether witchcraft is actually taking place. But to really come back to the point and what exactly took place and what exactly was going on, we need to recognize uh, some of the following issues. Uh, the, tr the trials, the judges themselves often went wrong because two key common law premises were reversed. In common law, one is always innocent until proven guilty. This is a biblical precept from the Old Testament. That's why it takes two or three witnesses to confirm an act and convict someone. Eyewitnesses, that is. Not even hearsay or second and third hand. Because you are presumed innocent until being proven guilty the biblical premise is imperative, and yet, when someone's name was breathed out by one of these girls, they became guilty until having to prove their innocence. Now, it's interesting to note in Vindication of the Puritans that this was a nine-month period when common law seemed to be abandoned. Indeed, throughout all of New England's history, we see the premise that one is innocent until proven guilty, and yet during these nine months, there was an abandonment with that premise. It there was an acceptance also, secondarily, of private and spectral evidence. The acceptance of someone's dream or vision at night as evidence in court, when it certainly couldn't be corroborated. You could say just about anything you want that took place in private and it could not be proven, and therefore it was the accepting of this as evidence that bypassed the two or three eyewitness clause of Scripture and common law, and thus this defined Hysteria. If one wants to define what could happen in any culture if the premise that you're innocent till proven guilty gets reversed and you're actually guilty till proven innocent. And secondarily, if evidence can be brought into court of someone's vision or someone's dream or someone's idea or, or simply uh, so, something that supposedly happened based on only one person describing it, then indeed we could have another hysteria. When Tituba Indian took the stand and they began to question her, she confessed freely her involvement with the occult and her involvement with the girls. It was assumed that the girls were getting involved in neutrality, getting involved as victims, getting involved though they were responsible. And yet the personal responsibility of those children to their parents, the personal responsibility of the parents themselves to take proper oversight over those girls was never stressed enough. In fact, one individual who had, Giles Corey, who uh, the only individual that was pressed to death by having the torturous method borrowed from England, not used in the colonies very often, of putting stones upon someone's chest until they properly 
really confess what you want them to confess. He refused. In fact, he said that the best way to deal with the, say, these witch trials was to take the girls out behind the shed and give them a good switching and a good proper spanking from their parents and get them back under discipline of their parents. Well, in one sense, uh, the covering of the parents was an issue that was not dealt with enough and that could have stopped this from happening. But probably the strangest and some of the most damaging consequences of these witch trials could be illustrated in the trial of Rebecca Nurse. Rebecca Nurse was one of the three leading intercessors, prayer warriors, Christians in the town. And indeed, these, this, um, as a Christian in the town, when she took the stand and began to be accused of being a witch, she began to pray. Every time she raised her hands, there were more demonic manifestations from the girls. Spiritual warfare was going on before their eyes, and yet it was attributed that she must be a witch, for every time she moved her hand, the other girls began to have specific manifestations. Thus, a hysteria can put innocent people to death. And that is indeed what happened. But were there any warnings that began to take place as these trials ensued? Oh, yes, there were. In fact, Cotton Mather said the following, I do still think that when there is no further evidence against a person, but only this, that a specter in their shape does afflict the neighbor, that evidence is not enough to convict the person of witchcraft, that the devils have a natural power which makes them capable of exhibiting what shape they please, I suppose nobody doubts, and I have no absolute promise of God that they shall not exhibit mine. Cotton Mather was recognizing that if we begin to accept this kind of thing, even the spiritual leaders who were dealing with this could be accused. In fact, some high spiritual leaders that were known well as key Christians were accused later on, and that began to open people's eyes. And so you recognize that indeed, this kind of a warning was not heeded anywhere near enough. Increase Mather also exhibited a warning. And uh, he said the following, The Holy Son of God himself was reputed a magician, and one that had familiarity with the greatest of devils. There is then not the best saint on earth, man or woman, that can assure themselves that the devil shall not cast such an imputation upon them. Indeed, a warning that was needed. A general warning was even exhibited by a group of clergy who felt that this trials were getting out of hand. They wrote, quote, we judge that in the prosecution of these and all such witchcrafts, there is need of a very critical and exquisite caution, lest by too much credulity for things received only upon the devil's authority, there be a door opened for a long train of miserable consequences, and Satan get an advantage over us, for we should not be ignorant of his devices. End quote. A sound warning, and yet it didn't occur quick enough. Of the twenty that were put to death. More than 100 were accused, but of the, and many died in prison. But of the 20 who were actually put to death for the capital crime of witchcraft, in studying the lives of every one of those 20, I've come to the conclusion that half, 10 of them, were Christians. And some were the leading intercessors in the community. Indeed, a demonic attack upon the Christian community. Four were involved in the occult, and two were involved with witchcraft. And the remaining four were non-believers who refused to confess to something they didn't do. And the ironic part is if you confess to being a witch, you got grace and you didn't often get the death penalty. But if you refused to confess you were a witch and their manifestations continued, you were put to death. Indeed, the reverse of common law, the reverse of the premises by which all of New England and America was built took place in these nine months. They were a nine-month period where it seems we lost our biblical way, demonstrating the real uh, power and war that was going on. And yet, a day of fasting and prayer was called, recognizing some of the errors in this, for January 14, 1693. And in 1693, when this uh, prayer and fast Day was called, the court said the following, that all iniquity may be put away which hath stirred God's holy jealousy against this land, that he would show us what we know not, and help us wherein we have done amiss to do so no more. Referring to the late tragedy raised among us by Satan and his instruments through the awful judgment of God, he would humble us therefore and pardon all the errors of his servants and people that desire to love his name. So the court called everyone to a public day of repentance. On that very day, in church, 
that was called for the repentance of the Salem witch trials, one of the judges, seated in the Old South Church in Boston, stood and handed a note to the pastor who went forward, Samuel Willard, who read the confession of Samuel Sewell to a stunned congregation. It read as, this, it read as follows, quote, Samuel Sewell, sensible of the reiterated strokes of God upon himself and family, being sensible that as to the guilt contracted upon the opening of the late commissioner of Oyer and Terminer at Salem, to which the order for this day relates, he is upon many accounts more concerned than any that he knows of, desires to take the blame and shame of it, asking pardon of men and especially desiring prayers that God, who has an unlimited authority, would pardon that sin and all other of his, personally and relative, according to his infinite benignity and sovereignty, not visit the sin of him or of any other upon himself or any of his, nor upon the land, but that he would powerfully defend him against all temptations to sin for the future and vouchsafe him the efficacious saving conduct of his word and spirit. Indeed, the trials began to end. They ended in October of 1692 when the 20th person had been put to death on September 22nd. After five key days, where capital punishment was carried out, 19 by hanging, one by being pressed to death. And then the repentance began to flow the next year. And following that, we recognize that one of the most dramatic repentances came from Ann Putnam, who had been 12 years of age during the time, and one of the girls who accused more than any other, more people than anyone else, of being a witch. At 26 years of age, an embittered single individual, she stood up in the Salem church, and asked that in 1706, she said the following, quote, I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family in the year about 92, that I then being in my childhood should by such a providence of God be made an instrument for the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime whereby their lives were taken away from them whom now I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time, whereby I justly fear I have been instrumental with others, through, though ignorantly and unwittingly, to bring upon myself and this land the guilt of innocent blood, though what was said or done by me against any person I can truly and uprightly say before God and man, I did it not out of any anger, malice, or ill will to any person, for I had no such thing against any of them, but what I did was ignorantly being deluded by Satan." One of the amazing stories is the fact that the Salem Church openly pardoned Ann Putnam, allowed her to become a member again and take communion. And many have pointed to this date in 1706 as the real beginning of the Great Awakening, when repentance took place for what had taken place earlier. Well, as we conclude, what kind of lessons can be learned from such an ordeal of nine months in American history? Puritans and witches. Certainly it's not as simple as saying the Puritans, I guess, shouldn't have believed against witchcraft. Or maybe no witchcraft was going on, they simply imagined it. No, too, many, too much evidence for too many supernatural manifestations took place for such a conclusion. Indeed, the conclusion cannot be that the Puritans were simply wrong for believing that witchcraft was wrong. No, they followed the Bible. That was their conscience. Indeed, it also could be true that the witches that were actually practicing witchcraft, did they get their just punishment? No, not at all. Because they did not get the kind of trial that would have been fair and just. What were the lessons that we can learn? Well, one key lesson could be this. We must teach our children to forgive and not hold bitterness. We should watch what we talk about, the people we might hold grudges against. Are we training our children to hold grudges and to deal in unforgiveness? If we are, we're opening their lives up. As the Bible says in Ephesians 4, give, give no room for the devil. That's spoken to believers. We must take heed for that. Second, we must keep the lines of jurisdiction clean between church and state. If the individual and family don't do their part, the church ends up taking on too much. If the church doesn't practice its own church discipline, it leaves the state with too much jurisdiction, which is what occurred in Salem. If spiritual warfare is left to the civil laws and states and judges to conduct, then indeed abuses will reign and deception can take place. A very clear lesson for our day to day. Another lesson is that the state must always adhere to being innocent until proven guilty, for if not, then another hysteria can occur, where one's reputation is lost immediately upon accusation. What kind of lessons take place today? The church today seems dead spiritually, often, unable to discern evil because it lives on the line between good and evil. It seems to lack equipping parents and families to do their God-given jobs of training children. 
And if it abandons church discipline and sinful believers who practice lawlessness are allowed to continue with gossip or slander or worse yet, uh, lawlessness and practicing sin, of, practicing sin of every kind undercover and yet sitting in church as uh, righteous believers, indeed, what can we expect? But more problems and even more problems in the civil sphere. The state has adopted today the premise that one is guilty until proven innocent. And the hysteria continues. It continues in the area of child abuse. If someone is accused of abusing children, they're automatically guilty. They have to go through a process of proving their innocence. Indeed, it is an hysteria when we deal with child abuse today. Not that there isn't child abuse or legitimate punishment that needs to occur with those who do abuse children. But we must be very careful. Because the same is true with sexual abuse. Someone can say that someone has abused someone sexually and they have almost no recourse to defend themselves because indeed they're guilty till proven innocent. Or even deadbeat dads who are accused of not paying the right child support to the state. Often states have begun to side unwittingly with the woman to such a degree that a husband is ending up paying far more than is just and due and then attempts to deal with it. Now, the, the husband is not correct if he refuses to pay child support. But often, as a deadbeat dad, one is guilty till proven innocent. On and on we could go. Thus, to say that these were nine months in American history that we should learn a lesson from, very true. But nine months in American history that have never been repeated, not true. In fact, if we took all of Puritan history of the 1600s and the 1700s prior to the American Revolution, we have more than 200 years where only nine months one was guilty until being proven innocent and these types of things took place. Whereas today it happens every day, every month, and every year because our culture has abandoned the Christian moorings that the Puritans held. And that's why the Salem witch trials were an exception and not the rule. The Salem witch trials are mocked today, yet the same mistake is being made today by the state. We attempt to deal by law with moral and spiritual issues with an inept church unwilling to prophetically speak to the culture. We assume everyone's guilty until proven innocent. And thus, the hysteria is perpetuated. When one considers that individuals that were under demonic bondage in the 1690s and earlier were prayed for and delivered by biblical practice, biblical obedience, submission to parents when they're children under age, we recognize that James 4 tells us, you submit to God and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. So one major overarching lesson is this. Unless we, as a church of Jesus Christ and as individual believers and families, become more submissive to God and his word, all the resisting of the devil will not have much of an effect. The exhortation that stays with us is to learn from the providential working of God in American history. Let us submit to God in a greater way that indeed when we resist the work of the enemy, he will flee from us. May God bless you. Amen.